Okay. We're learning Masech Shabbos. It's the last page today of the tractate. The name of the chapter is Mishiach chapter 24. Kuf Nun Zayn. 157. On the top, we may not split wood from beams for firewood on Yom Tov. No, from a beam that broke on Yom Tov. This anonymous Mishnah clearly supports Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, so how could Rabbi Yechon have said that the law follows Rabbi Shimon? It says in number one, the Mishnah here refers to a stack of wood that has been set aside for later use in construction. Number two, since a broken beam is unfit for use in construction, it normally would be used, normally be used for firewood. However, since this particular beam was whole at the sunset of Yom Tov, it could be prepared at that time for its present Yom Tov use as firewood. Consequently, it is Muktzeh, according to Rav Yehuda, whose view this Mishnah. As to whether the first case in the Mishnah must reflect the view of Rabbi Uda or might Rabbi Shimon concede that a stack of wood that has been set aside for construction is Muktzah. The first was discussing it in Beitza, Jack's Beitza. So Rabbi Yochan, Rabbi Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Uda, Master Rabbi Yochan does not consider that Mishnah to be anonymous. Rather, he taught that the Mishnah reflects the opinion of Rabbi Yosi by Yehuda. Rabbi Yechadim had, in number three, it says Rabbi Yechadim had a different version of that Mishnah, in Rabbi Yechadim's version, the Mishnah ended, these are the words of Rabbi Yechadim by Yehuda. He did not view the Mishnah as anonymous. Okay. Tashma Barim Azatevet, come learn a proof to this from the following Mishnah. We may begin using a stack of straw as fuel for a fire on Yom Tov. But not wood that in the in a backyard. This Mishnah seems to follow the view of it. So we have to remember in Muktzah there's um, the, it's similar similar law to Shabbos. It has to be muhan, it has to be prepared. Right. You can't change the designation on Shabbos and, and also on Yom Tov. So that's really the this thing is if you prepare the wood to use for fire on Yom Tov, it's fine. But this is was not prepared, even though you can't use it. It's not per se usable for construction, but you can just um, decide I'm going to prepare it now for Yom Tov. Because you could have done it before Yom Tov. Yeah. So the Gemara says also That's what it means. Eitzim should be wood that is in the backyard. Also, the wood referred to here, to there, refer, referred to there, that Mishnah is expensive wood. Namely, namely the wood of male cedars and ashuche. What is ashuche? So it says number seven, ashuche are the female cedar trees. The male trees, there's female trees. Did you know this? No. Yeah, the male trees are not producing. So if you can have a tree that would not produce, so there's a there's treatment to do to it, to turn it into a producing tree, it's called male trees. Ashkuri are the female uh, cedar trees. The lumber of cedar trees is expensive and is, it is used and is used exclu- exclusively for construction, not as fuel. Even Abishima would consider it to be mukta. You need a cedar chest, a cedar closet. They're very nice. Yeah. They smell good. So the Gemara says the Mukta Mahmas Kis, which because it is a Mukta for fear of monetary loss, Philo Bishimon made even Rabbi Shimon admit is Mukta. The synonymous Mishnah does not run counter to Rabbi Shimon's view. Gemara cites another, uh, the Gemara cites 
another anonymous Mishnah that reflects with, uh, with uh, that conflicts with Rabbi Shimon. Again, posing a difficulty for Rabbi Yechol and Tashma, come learn the following Mishnah. So we're holding in 157, A1, in the right column. Tashma, come learn the following Mishnah. Ein mashkin v'shechot nitzamit bolios. We may not water and slaughter range animals. Why? Since they are not prepared for consumption on Yom Tov. Our mashkin v'shechot is our But we may water and slaughter domestic animals. The anonymous Mishnah, so now the watering of the animal was done for its shechita. Yeah. It's easier to fill up the skin if the animal has a lot of water. So, animal that was prepared, which is a domestic animals, then you're allowed to. But if it's a range animals, it's not necessarily prepared for shechita. Right. But Yom Tov, then you shouldn't do it. Let's see if I was right about the watering, that it's for the skin. Let's see, look at number, let's see, number 11. Wage animals are, are animals that pasture freely and are not seen for as a, an extended period of time. They are not accessible at the onset of Yom Tov. They do not stand to be used on Yom Tov and are therefore Mukta according to Abu Dazu. All of your dismission as follows. Now, domestic animals, on the other hand, pasture beyond the tomb of a settled area but come back to spend the night within the tomb. So that's the difference between domestic and range. In this, uh, in this case, usually you say domestic and non-domestic is the the difference between chay and behema, animal and, and regular animals, and non and non-domestic animals. Over here, the difference is this: both of, could be the same animals, but some of them are pasturing far away and they don't come back at night. Right. They come back after, let's say, the summer or after the winter. They go for seasons. Right. And some animals, they come back every night. So the animals that come back every night, they can be considered Domestic. prepared. Yeah. Okay. Domestic and then prepared. And the animals that don't, they cannot be, so you're not allowed to shech them and water them. So look at the second paragraph of 11. It says, the Mishnah mentions watering in conjunction with slaughtering, only because it was common practice to water animals before slaughtering them in order to facilitate their skinning. You see? Yeah. Watering, uh, watering them in and of itself is not prohibited at all, since they they fall under the category of animals for whose feeding one is responsible. But this is in a connection with shechita. That's why it's because just for watering them, it's not a problem. Rabbi Yechonon Stama Achina Ashkach. Rabbi Yechonon found another anonymous Mishnah. We may remove bones and husks from the table on Shabbos, on Shabbos by hand. Rabbi Yechonon Stama Achina Ashkach. Rabbi Yechonon found another anonymous Mishnah. Rabbi Yechonon Stama Achina Ashkach. Rabbi Yechonon found another anonymous Mishnah. 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 Rabbi Yechonon found another anonymous we ain't lanu ella. We have no uh, reliance on this version, the Mishnah, for it um, reverses the opinions, but rather on the following version, which I heard from my master's base, Shammai Kabbuda, Bishamai rule like Kabbuda, and prohibit the direct handling of bones and, and shells. We still Kabbishimu, and while we still rule like Kabbishimu, and permit, and permit this, since in this version, we should accord Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Yochan decided in Rabbi Shimon's favor, despite the existence of a contrary anonymous Mishnah. Now, beside the dispute whether or not an object must be prepared for Shabbos and Yom Tov, besides the dispute whether or not an object must be prepared for Shabbos and Yom to use, Rabbi Uda and Rabbi Shimon dispute several other areas of Shabbos law. The Gemara records an Amoraic dispute regarding the final halacha in these matters. Ravach and Ravina disputed the halacha. Regarding all the laws of Shabbos, the law follows Rabbi Shimon. 
Levar me muksa machmas mus, except in regard to the issue of muksa by dint of repugnance, where the law follows Abiuda. Umainu, and what is an example of this? Neriyoshin, an old used clay lamp. Even regard to the issue of muktze by dint of repugnance, the law follows of Bishimon. The law always follows of Bishimon. Except in regard to the issue of muktze by dint of prohibition. So far we learned muktze machmas mus. It's muktzeh because of its repugnance, and there's muktzeh machmas sisu. It's muktzeh by dint of a prohibition. Mind you, what is the, what is the example of muktzeh machmas isu? Muktzeh by dint of prohibition. Now she look at the shabbos, a lamp which a flame, a flame had been lit for the shabbos and which was burning at the onset of shabbos, even though the fire has since gone out. It is considered muktzeh by dint of a prohibition. Aval muktzeh machmas chesron keys. However, in regard to something that is muktzeh for fear of monetary loss, I feel Rabbi Shimon may the even Rabbi Shimon can see that it it should be treated stringently. That non kol akeli. You tell him the Shabbos. All utensils may be taken on the Shabbos. Chutz mi masal gadol except for a large saw. We also should achvesho and a Coulter, which are not used for other purposes, lest they become damaged. Meaning they have a very designated purpose. Right. They, they're usually never used for other things beside of what you usually do. And these are an agricultural tool, specifically the large knife-like part of a plow that cuts into the ground to make furrows. So, it would be clear off the bones and huts from the table, or would, uh, like if you have a plastic tablecloth, you take everything in the, in the cloth and punch it up. And that's it. Put another tablecloth for next. That's the opinion of Rabbi Hill. Uh, right. They say just do it with Shino like this. Okay. Right. But if you have bones in the plate, you just take off the plate. Yeah. You know, yeah. Directly that's, every, that's every... Yeah, fine. That's not a problem. We film the dome with Shabbos. We may not vows on Shabbos. Showing the dome, showing the tzurich on Shabbos, and we may seek release for vows made to abstain from things that are necessary for Shabbos. We're faking somewhere, and we may temporarily shutter a window on the Shabbos to, I guess, to avoid light coming in. We may do some atlas, and we may storm like we had last week. Why? Oh, pikoch nefesh, it uh, goes under a different category if it's pikoch nefesh. You know, I just had to pull the things down. Uh. Right. And we may measure a reg to determine whether it is to, um, it is able to generate tumor. Wait in some mikveh, and we may measure a mikveh to determine whether it, it measures three cubic amis. So, my sebab, we may have a bitzak, we may have a shol ben botnis. Of an incident in the days of Rabbi Tzadok's fa- father. And in the days of Abba Shol ben Botnis, in which they shuttered the window with an earthenware flask, and they tied an earthenware vessel with a strand of reed grass, in order to determine whether or not there was a handbreadth sized opening in a certain barrel. And from their words we learned that we may shudder, measure, and tie on the Shabbos. The Gemara sets forth an inquiry regarding the Mishnah's ruling concerning annulment. We said that. When the Mishnah permits annulment of vows, annulment of vows on Shabbos, it allows both annulment that is necessary for the Shabbos and that that which is not necessary for the Shabbos, or or maybe just seeking release for vows that are necessary for Shabbos. Yes, it is permitted. The things that are not necessary for Shabbos, no, it is not permitted. And because of this, Distinction that the Mishnah separated these methods 
of abrogating vows uh, from one another. Or Dilma, or perhaps we say, that with regard to annulment of vows too, if the annulment is necessary for the Shabbos, yes, it is permitted. But if it is not necessary for the Shabbos, then no, it is not permitted. And the reason the Mishnah separated these words, these methods, from one another is not because of any difference between them with respect to vows whose abrogation is, ne- is not necessary for the Shabbat. Because an annulment does not require a court. While seeking release does require a court. Tashma come learn prove the son is Zuti the Ve of Papa for Zuti of the Academy of Papa fear in the Dom Shabbos the Zerha Shabbos one man no vows on the Shabbos if the annulment is necessary for the Shabbos. Zerha Shabbos saying we see from this Bible that if the annulment is necessary for Shabbos, yes, it may be performed on the Shabbos. Shabbos Lord, but if it is necessary. If it is not necessary for the Shabbos, no, it may not be performed. The inquiry is resolved. Okay, so only the only the Tzorich HaShabbos. If it's not Tzorich HaShabbos, not for the Shabbos need, not necessary for Shabbos, no. Another version of Lishnach, Yerbalu Tzorich HaTarvar Ketoni. Do we say that the Mishnah is limiting, limiting clause of that are are necessary for the Shabbos refers to both annulment and seeking release and shalom and that therefore if the annulment or annulment of the vow is not necessary for the Shabbos then no it is not permitted according to which we must conclude the annulment of vows may be performed from the moment one knows of the vows until the same moment a full 24 hours later or Dilma, he get on Letzerich. When did the Mishnah teach Letzerich? What does it mean? When did the Mishnah teach the clause of that are necessary for the Shabbos Hashayil or the Ketani? He taught it only with regard to the law seeking release on the Shabbos. Avala for us, and with regard to the annulment of vows, it may be performed even if it is not necessary for the Shabbos. We conclude that the annulment of vows may be performed only for the entire calendar day upon which the vows became known, but not for a, a full 24-hour period from that moment. So the question of whether vows that do not affect the Shabbos may be annulled on Shabbos is directly dependent on whether one's ability to annul a vow is limited to the calendar day upon which he learns of it, or whether it extends for a full 24-hour period from that time. If annulment is limited to the calendar day, then one may annul vows, one may annul even vows that have no bearing upon the Shabbos. For once the Shabbos passes, there will be no further opportunity to annul them. However, if the period given for annulment is 24, hour, 24 hours, then one may annul only vows that affect the Shabbos, since there will be opportunity to annul other sorts of vows after the Shabbos ends. Tashma, the Tony of Zuti, the way of Papi. Abzuti of the Akan of Papi taught a bison. If you don't Shabbos to a Shabbos, one may know vows of the Shabbos if the annulment is necessary for the Shabbos. Tzircha Shabbos ain, shelo tzircha Shabbos lo. If it's necessary for Shabbos, fine. If it's not, not. I'm a force in the place. We see that annulment of vows may be performed from the moment the vows became known until the same moment, a full 24 hours After that, they can't be, later. They can't be. Uh, Annulled, right? I mean, it's like if somebody, if, like, let's say your wife makes a vow. Right. If you if you silent, uh, if you silent and you don't know it, it sticks afterwards. Then you have to do. Uh, Go to uh, the rabbis. Yeah. Oh, Rashi, an antenan, a false don't call him. But we learned it. We we learned annulment of vows may be performed for no more than than the entire calendar day. 
Right. And in this uh, fact, there is both cause for leniency and cause for stringency and the time allowed for annulment. Keita. For example, no do little Shabbos. If she made a vow on Shabbos Eve, may for little Shabbos, he may Shabbos, as she teshach. He may he can annul it all the night of the Shabbos and all the Shabbos day until dark. No do im chashecho. But if she made the vow at the with the onset of dark on Shabbos day, just before night, for may for as she loyt teshach. He must annul before dark. She im loyefer. But if he has not annulled it. By dark, once it is already dark, he is unable to annul it anymore. So the Mishnah states explicitly that one may annul a vow only on the calendar day upon which he learns of it. It thus contradicts the implication of the aforesighted by tanoi. This issue is the subject of Tanoic dispute. The Tanya, for it has been taught in a Baisa. For us, the Dom annulment of vows may be performed for no more than the entire calendar day upon which the vows became known. The son of Rabbi Shimon said, It may be performed from the moment the vows became known until the same moment 24 hours later. The Mishnah cited the following opinion. The, 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 the Mishnah cited follows the opinion of the Tanakama of this Baisa, while the Baisa cited earlier is in accordance with Rabbi Yisi, Bayuda, and Rabbi Lozo, the son of Rabbi Shimon. And we may seek release from vows. When the Mishnah permits one to seek release from vows on the Shabbos. Let's refer only to a case in which he had no opportunity to do so before the Shabbos. Or does it perhaps refer even to a case in which he did have an opportunity to do so before the Shabbos? For the rabbis once involved them involved themselves with Rav Zutra, the son of Zerah, and released him from, the, from his vows on Shabbos. Even though he had an opportunity, to, uh, he had the opportunity to seek release before the Shabbos. We see that one may seek release on on the Shabbos even from vows that could have been dealt with before the Shabbos. There was an incident in which they shuttered the window with an earthenware flask. And they tied an earthenware vessel with a strand of reed grass. There was a narrow alley between two houses. I got a pathway between two houses. The tumor is a sham and tumor in the form of a corpse that was there in the alley. And a cracked barrel rested upon the two houses sheltering over the corpse. Focus on Mabatafiach before the person died, they had shuttered the window of the house with an earthen of flax to ensure that uh, he would that when he would die no tumor would enter the house. They tied an earthen vessel measuring a handbreadth wise with a strand of reed a grass and attempted to pass it through the crack in the barrel. Lady Mirsham Begigis to determine whether or not there was a handbreadth sized opening in the barrel that would allow the tumor to escape. And from the words we learn that we may shudder, measure, and tie on the Shabbos. The Gemara recounts an incident that bears upon the law of measuring on Shabbos. Ula happened to, to go to the house of the exiliarch. He saw Rabba Bar Ravuna, who was sitting in a tub of water on the Shabbos and was measuring it. Omar lay when did the rabbi say that one is allowed to measure on the Shabbos? Indeed, the mitzvah, only if it is measuring perform, performed for the purpose of mitzvah. The love mitzvah, but if it is not for the purpose of mitzvah, 
did they then say that it is permitted? No. Then do you measure, why do you measure the top? So he answered, I'm merely busying myself. I'm not measuring it for any purpose. This is how the end of Masechta. Uh, that's how the Masechta ends. So I didn't say the last words in the Hebrew. Hopefully it's not considered a seum. We can keep the seum for a different time, in time yeah. that we need it. Yeah, the seum when we get back to Shemun. And, uh, All right, here's the... To do a Mishnah, so, so the next tract it will be a tract at Eruvin. That's a shame. Well, so we'll just start the Mishnah of Eruvin to go from uh, General introduction. The tractate Yuvim and the second tractate of Seder Moed, the order of the Talmud that deals with the special times of the year, specifically the Shabbos, the festival and fast days. Following tractate Shabbos, the Yuvim defines and clarifies the Shabbos prohibition regarding the transfer of object from one domain to another, specifically. The rabbinic injunctions prohibiting transfers between private domains or of different kinds. And the prohibition against walking more than 2,000 amis <coughs> from the outer limits of one's area of residence. And now the am amr is about 18 inches. Uh, the word eruvin is the plural of eruv a community boundary and refers to the means ordained by the rabbis to permit such carrying or, or walking. This concept will be discussed further detail below. So we have uh, fundamental principles of tractate to moving. We have the one of the 39 melochas, the primary category is always uh, melochas, the primary categories of labor. And so one of them one of them is a transferring objects between a private and public domain, or four amos in public domain. So to this, the sages decreed several prohibitions against transferring even in private domain because this might lead to confusion regarding uh, public domains. But these prohibitions and uh, the adjustments required by, by the uh, sages to remove, to remove them are the subject of tractate Eruvin in order to provide an adequate understanding of this Sometimes very complex, very complex uh, tractate. Yeah. We introduce a number of the basic concepts and rules which uh, underlie it. Dalad Lishus, we have the four domains that we are familiar with Lishus Ayochi, the private, Lishus Rabim, the, the public domain. We have the Kamalis, an area intermediate between, between the public and private. And then there's a Mokam tool, there's an exempt area. Shusayochi, you all know, or Shusabim, also you know, uh, it, there's uh, obviously a uh, perimeter of what is a Shusarabim. So it says uh, a Shusarabim is, is a highway, a public area, open at both ends. It must be used by at least 600,000 people. They counted population of Jewish uh, encampment during their, their traveling in the wilderness to qualify as a Shusarab. Now, even if a street which meets all these conditions may be disqualified from being a uh, Shusarab, if it differs significantly from, from uh, the Jewish encampment in the wilderness, private ownership or a roof prevent a street from being classified as a Shusarab. Uh, you can have certain situations where it's not con will not be considered kushus sarabim. Then we have uh, kamelis, an area which cannot be classified as kushus sarabim because it lacks the of the necessary conditions. It is not set aside for public use. Then we have mokem two, a place is neither kushus sarabim nor kushus ayochid, but also lacks the dimensions of kamelis. It's width less than uh, four tefachim. Right with Kamalis, we know there must be at least for Tfachim. Yeah. 
so example for for Kamalis could be empty lot an open field empty lot or most elevations in Ushu Sorabim that rise between three and ten Tfokim, between three and ten above the ground it's almost like a, a little mountain yeah. a little uh, hip mound. mound yeah the area must also have a minimum dimensions of fold for him by fold for him to qualify for commonness. So on the biblical level, the prohibition against transferring object on the, on the, on the Shabbos applies only to transfer between Shusayoch and Shusorabim and to moving object for Amis and Shusorabim. That's the biblical level. This prohibition, which is commonly referred to as carrying, applies to other modes of transfer as well, such as throwing. Of course, the Kamalus resembles both the Shusorabim and the Shusayochid. The sages decree that it, is, uh, that it be treated with all the, st the strictures ap applicable to these two domains. Consequently, one may not carry an object for Amis in Kamalis, or carry between a Shusayochid and a Karmelis, no may one carry between a Shusrabim and a Karmelis. What's a Mokim Petur? So Mokim Petur is also a place that is neither a Shusrabim nor a Shusayochid, but it also lacks the dimensions of Karmelis. Its width is less than four Tfachim. It's called an exempt area. Then we'll, in Masechta, we're going to see something called Pirza Yeseiro Mesa Amos, a gap wider than 10 Amos, Poets Meruba Loimed, the gaps exceed the world portions, Tzuras Pesach, the shape of an opening, of a doorway, leniency is Lovud, good, Lovud. Provisions allows us to consider uh, two solid surfaces separated by space, measuring less than three Tfachim, good. Uh, provisions allow us to, to extend partitions uh, confer, uh, confirming to the 10 tefach minimum areas. A good achis mechitzasor, good asik mechitzasor. Extend the partition downward, extend the partition upward. Piti kayod v'seisim, the edge of a roof extend downward and seals. There's many, many uh, movies we already discussed. Karpaf, we saw it in Shabbos also, an area enclosed but not for residential purposes. Vegetable garden is an example for Karpaf. Iruve Chatzero is Iruve Shitufim Mavois. Provision against carrying into communal courtyards, permitting a, commun a communal courtyards in valley. Okay, so we have a lot, uh, a lot at stake in this tractate. As an, an uh, example over here, what is chotzer, what is more than foolish. We'll discuss it tomorrow. So the Mishnah is. We're going to do the mission again tomorrow, but just to start something. It says, Movoy Ali, that is higher than 20 Amis. Imat, what, is, what does he mean by Imat? Imat, one must decrease the height of uh, the entryway. He must lower the Kaira to within uh, 20 Amis. Rabuda says he, he, he need not lower the Kaira. It is valid even when higher than 20 Amis. So if the entranceway of a Mavi alleyway is defi as defined by the curve by the cross being placed over it is higher than 20 Amis, higher than 20 Amis cubits measured uh, from the ground below to the curve, you might, one must decrease the height of the entranceway, he must lower the curve within 20 Amis. If carrying is to be permitted in the mother, because a cross beam higher than 20 amis is not a valid kair. Abuddha says he need not lower the kair, as it is valid even when higher than 20 amis. And if the mother entrance is wider than tamis, he might. He must decrease the width. He must fence off the access 
with until the opening is no wider than ten amas. However, if the this wide entranceway has a tzulas apesach, has the form of a doorway consisting of a post at either side of, and a crossbar on top of them, even if the entranceway is wider than ten amas, you need not decrease the width, since a tzulas apesach is valid even when wider than ten amas. That's the Mishnah of Eruvin, the first mission of Eruvin. It says, although the Mishnah literally speaks of the height of the Mavai, the reference is to the Koira that is placed over its entrance. The Mishnah is uh, following the occasional device of using the name of the hole, in this case the Mavai, to refer to one of its parts, in this case the Koira. So now we have to understand this whole purpose, this whole um, koira, this whole beam is for to create an eruv. So the question is, if it's above esrim amris, it says you might. He needs to lower it. That's what the Mishnah tells us. In order to qualify it as an eruv, so you have so to lower it. Th- that's 30, 30 feet, basically. Um, if you do twenty times eighteen, that's thirty. 360, and then you divide it by 12, uh, 30, 30 feet. So the, the beam could be 30 feet high. need to be a little lower. The Mishnah says you might. According to Rabbi Uda, it doesn't have to lower it. That's what the Mishnah is so telling us. They're you. using the telephone wires for part of the arrow. Yeah, they're not 30 feet high. Oh. But according to Rabbi Uda, it doesn't need to. It's only according to the Tanakama. Now, if the if the mava, if it is wider than ten amos, it needs to decrease it. Wider, if it's yeah, wider I mean, no, than ten. Wider. I'm trying to think. What is it? the mava is is a, is a courtyard, right? No, but the thing is, that's what I just read. Although the Mishnah literally speaks of the height of the mava, the reference is to the koyla. They're dealing with the the koyla, the beam itself. It's placed over its entranceway. So Abu uh, said. It doesn't. But if the if this wide entrance way has a tzuras pesach form of a doorway consisting of a post at either sides and a crossbar on top of them, so when do you have to decrease its width when it doesn't have a shape of an opening, but when it has source a petach, it doesn't have to decrease its opening, even though it's ten. We'll continue this tomorrow, God willing. You, you're going to have your... Um,